working in the greenhouse at Experimental Farm. Uh, some of you might remember the chrysanthemum show there. I, I used to uh, grow the, the mums for the show. And then I went on to, in 1980, I went on to work in the Arboretum. And I had a real passion for trees. And uh, I was very fortunate to be able to learn a lot and work with trees. Uh, but I would, during the winter, when the season had been slow, I would go to the library of the Sir John Carling building, and I would read up different books and periodicals on trees. In particular, uh, I really liked the um, Journal of the International Society of Arboriculture. And even back then, back in the early 1980s, they were talking about plant communication or how, and I always refer to trees, but it, it, I, I, most likely a, um, would um, uh, apply to uh, most plants, but you'll hear me talk a lot about trees tonight because trees are really my passion. I live uh, just outside of Morrowood and I have a five acre property. I've been there since 1984. I've planted tons of stuff on my property, anything that will grow. I've killed a lot of trees because I've tried to grow trees that weren't hardy here, but uh, like Japanese maples, <laughs> especially in the country. But anyways, just to, to get started, um, people have been um, wondering about talking plants or plants talk and communicate for a long time. This is a, uh, an illustration <coughs> from uh, Lewis Carroll's second book, <coughs> Through the Looking Glass. Uh, and what Alice found there. This was written in 1872, and I don't know if anybody, anybody remembers when Alice enters into a, a garden of live flowers where she encounters uh, uh, flowers that can talk. So she, uh, she's lost and she looks at this uh, tiger lily and she says, oh, I wish you could talk. And the tiger lily says, uh, we can talk when there's anybody worth talking to. So. People, even back then, were speculating on, on whether or not plants could talk. So, um, we have to look at uh, outside the box a bit, because plants, like as, as Owen said, trees are, are not moving targets. They're, they're, they're sitting targets for insects. So, they have to defend themselves one way or another. And one of the things that is, has been discovered, and even back when I was uh, uh, reading the uh, Society of Arboriculture journal, they were talking about uh, VOCs, plants producing VOCs, volatile organic compounds. And they communicate by exuding these compounds uh, through the air. And they, they, they talk to each other that way. They also communicate underground, mainly through a series of uh, fungal network called mycorrhiza. And these mycorrhiza connect the roots of various trees. If you go to a, a forest, or any bush lot around here that's undisturbed, there will be a network of underground uh, mycorrhizal uh, fungus or fungi that connect the trees together. So we'll talk about that as well. So um, the, um, the plants, essentially we know that plants can sense certain things. They can sense gravity. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever tried to plant a bulb upside down. If you plant upside down, it will grow up. It knows uh, where the light is and it knows, knows what, what, what gravity is all about. The roots will go down towards uh, uh, the, the gravity. Uh, it can sense light. Plants will grow towards the light. Yeah, anybody that's grown house plants by, by their windows, you have to turn them because they can gravitate towards the stronger light. Uh, temperature, uh, soil quality and soil moisture. The roots will grow towards the best soil and, and, and the moisture. They won't grow towards dry soil. Um, presence of microorganisms in the soil, which is very important. Sir, a lot of microorganisms will help uh, uh, digest some of the, what we would call, it's not really plant food, uh, they're, they're uh, nutrients that some of the plants can't take up unless they're, 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 they've been digested by some of the microorganisms. So, but most importantly, plants can sense uh, signals from other plants. And we're gonna tell you how that happens. If you have any questions along the way, you know, feel free to ask. Um, so, next slide please. Um, this is a sort of a, just a schematic of uh, what we're going to be looking at. There's above ground communication through the production of volatile organic compounds that are absorbed by the stomata which are on, on, on the underside of the leaves. And underground, uh, one, I want to mention one more thing um, that's being studied right now. It's fairly new. It's called uh, plant bioacoustics. And it's essentially sounds and vibrations 
uh, that plants emit and they can read off each other. Uh, there's a researcher, I believe in Australia, I'll talk about her later, who's doing a lot of work with that. Uh, but underground, it's the network of uh, fungal mycorrhiza. Uh, somebody coined the term. They're so, it's so widespread, especially in undisturbed soils, that somebody coined the term wood white web. <laughs> because, because it's woody plants are all attached. You go to a, a, a bush lot here, anywhere, a mature forest, you will notice that there are young trees, there are medium-sized trees, and there's usually a few of the really large, older trees. Those are the mother trees. They've been around for so long, and they foster the development of mycorrhizal associations with the roots. They're in touch with pro probably all the trees in the forest, and the trees help each other that way. They, they nourish each other. And it's been shown that these mother plants will actually recognize their own seedlings, and they will help them along, grow along, because in the forest, going to have some uh, shady conditions and the trees grow more slowly if there's a break in the canopy then the tree starts to grow that's when the mother tree will shoot some nutrients to the little tree and it'll start growing even more so this is quite an interesting uh, concept actually and it really happens in situations where there's development like typically new, new housing developments around here they strip the topsoil and they, they disturb everything the uh, mycorrhiza are usually destroyed in those in, in, the, in that situation. So when you replant, it's good to inoculate the soil uh, by some uh, uh, mycorrhiza, uh, mycorrhizal powder, uh, and, and and put it in the soil in contact with the roots to establish uh, a new uh, uh, mycorrhizal population in the soil. So, uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, caterpillars. Oh, aphids, beetles, all kinds of insects. We, we've seen them uh, uh, attack our, our plants, our trees. Um, and as Owen mentioned, sometimes they're, you know, they seem defenseless, but actually they, do, are, they are able to communicate to each other uh, if, there's a, if, if there's a presence of an insect. And what they can do uh, in most normal situations, and I say normal because when there's an outbreak like the emerald ash borer, the, 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 the game changes. It's not, it's not the same anymore. But in most normal situations, when you have some insects that attack a plant, the, the, the tree or the plant will change its chemical composition to make it less palatable for the insect that's eating on it. So the insect will, have to, will want to go somewhere else. So it'll reduce its nutrient um, richness, if you will, and it makes make it even distasteful for, for, for the insect. So the insect will go someplace else. But what it does also is it produces these VOCs, volatile organic compounds, that are wafting through the air, and the other trees pick it up. And the other trees, before they get attacked by the insects, they start to change their own chemical composition in anticipation of uh, uh, the attack by the insects. Um, next slide, please. So, <coughs> um, you've probably uh, seen these um, 10 caterpillars. When I first moved out to where I am now in 1984 and 85, I planted lots of trees and I planted a, a lot of crab apples uh, because I like them. Uh, I like flowers in the spring, I like the, the, the crab apples on them. But I did notice that I would get a lot of tent caterpillars. And instead of, instead of trying to get rid of them, I started observing them. And I noticed that at the beginning of the cycle, there would be, uh, let's say uh, typically of uh, maybe a hundred or so, very tiny caterpillars in the nest. Now these, they, during the day they're in the nest, they come out at night to feed on the, uh, on the foliage and they go back in their nest. And usually we tend to t rip the nest out to destroy the, the, the caterpillars. So I, I decided to leave them and I watched and uh, they, didn't, they didn't destroy that much of the, of the tree. They tend to focus on one or two branches and by the, by the time these were full grown and they were ready to pupate before turning into a moth. I noticed that there were only about maybe four, five, six of them left, you know, from the original, like say 100. So I, I assumed that they were being eaten by other things. So birds, many birds will eat them, but some birds will stay away from caterpillars that have uh, uh, long, uh, long spiny uh, things on their, you know, like on their backs. But um, I remember in the Arboretum watching uh, uh, a chickadee feed on a, 
on a full grown uh, gypsy moth caterpillar. The gypsy moth caterpillars are very hairy and they have the spikes on their backs. With the chickadees, and chickadees are very resourceful, uh, they would take a caterpillar, which is almost as long as, as itself, would turn it upside down and start pecking away at the, ins the soft underbelly. <laughs> and they would eat it that way, leaving the skin there. And uh, the chickadees would also eat the, the um, gypsy moth egg masses. I would observe them during the winter going uh, on the trees and finding the gypsy moth egg masses and start feeding on them. So the chickadees are very good for controlling all kinds of insects, and many of the small birds are. So, uh, next slide, please. <coughs> Nathan, uh, who's that? Who hasn't seen an aphid? I mean, if you're growing any kind of plants, you're going to see aphids. And uh, aphids are probably one of the best uh, juicy foods for, 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 a, for a lot of insects and for birds. Um, I remember uh, when I was in the Arboretum one year, I had found some uh, little black tiny eggs in the, uh, under the leaf uh, was, uh, of the willow, the willow trees. And that was before they, they, they would break out in the spring. And I didn't know what they were, and I brought them to uh, our entomology section on the farm, and, uh, and it was too early, I guess the eggs weren't hatching, so they couldn't tell what they were just by the, looking at the eggs. So in the spring, I noticed they, were, they would start to hatch, and they were aphids. Just as the leaves were starting to come out, I said, oh my god, we've got a really infestation of aphids. I said, I said don't tell the boss, he'll make a spray. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what I decided to do is I decided to watch. And at that time, the warbler migration was coming through the arboretum. All the warblers were coming through, and the vireos, all the migratory birds were coming through, and they'd stop in the arboretum, obviously, lots of trees, and a great place to snack and feed along the way when, as they go up north. Within a matter of a week, there was not an aphid to be seen in the willows. They were, they were all gone. And, you know, uh, in the old days, they would have taken out the sprayer, let's get rid of those aphids. But, and I noticed it on, uh, on maple trees as well. <laughs> And what I found out in doing some research was that the trees that are attacked uh, by, by aphids or by any other insects, they send out signals that are also picked up by birds and other predatory insects. And because I, I was wondering, I said, you know, I said, I was watching these birds coming into this uh, uh, maple tree e eating, eating aphids. And I said, how do those birds know there's aphids in that tree? You can't see them, you know, they're so small. But okay, maybe the other birds that were in there were chirping so loud and, you know, having such a party that the other bird was saying, hey, let's go out and have a look and see what's, you know, what's up there. But it turns out that the tree will actually send out signals that will attract some of the predators to come in and clean up the, uh, uh, the, the, the aphid uh, or the insect infestation. Next slide. Beetles, another one uh, where um, same thing happens, uh, you know, a lot of beetles will be uh, chewing up uh, your plants and uh, uh, the plants uh, change their chemical composition and they, they send out signals for predators, so. Uh, okay. Now, below ground. What's happening below ground is the mycorrhizal fungus attaches itself to the uh, root tips of, 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 uh, uh, of the tree roots and it, in, it encompasses the tip and it penetrates some of the cells cellular walls and what they do is these 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 fungal um, roots which they call hyphae they can break down some of the nutrients in particular phosphorus in, in forms that are unavailable to the plants they break it down and they feed the trees with it they feed the trees they can go a lot further than the, the tree roots can they can reach moisture that the tree roots can't they can they can de uh, uh, take apart nutrients feed it to the trees, and in exchange, the tree will uh, feed some carbohydrates to the, the fungus so that it can survive because they, they don't photosynthesize, so they need something to live on. They either live on, on rotting uh, material, like saprophytic fungi will, uh, will uh, feed on, on decaying wood, but this type of fungus has developed a symbiotic relationship with the trees by attaching itself to the roots, getting some nutrients from the trees, and in exchange, feeding the tree. Now occasionally you'll see a mushroom, which is the fruiting body, but the main body of the plant, the mycelium, is all underground. Uh, next slide. Typically, in a, in a forest like this, you'll see a lot of trees, and this is full of, of uh, mycorrhizal fungi. It's on an undisturbed soil, 
And these, these fungi are active underneath there, helping these trees grow and thrive. Some of the larger trees, they're maybe connected to everything that's theirs and, and, and helping the other trees. They help each other survive. Uh, if, uh, if a tree is not doing well because it's dying uh, for whatever reason, um, it will eventually fall and rot and provide nutrients for the other trees. Again, this is another example. This is a probably a, a, a single stand tree, a tree that you know you would find in an open field or something, and it can have mycorrhizal attachments with other trees nearby. It can range pretty far. In situations like that, the roots can go quite far. <coughs> Next slide, please. Again, another <coughs> situation where this is a young uh, forest uh, where you will find uh, uh, a lot of mycorrhizal attachments in the roots. Next slide. Now, this is a seedling, a tree seedling. Looks a bit like a white pine, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, what do you think? <laughs> Coniferous, for sure. Um, most of the root mass here, you'll probably see uh, it's um, fungal mycorrhiza. You'll see the roots of uh, the tree. Um, and in a good soil, in a good healthy uh, soil that's alive, or an organic soil, you'll get a quick attachment to the roots. Uh, you can always inoculate the soil by buying a, a mycorrhizal uh, um, powder, putting it in there. And once the tree has uh, latched onto that, it starts to grow uh, better and faster. And you'll, you'll develop a stronger tree. And uh, people might say, well, you know, do I need to put some stuff in the soil? I mean, mycorrhiza is everywhere. But in situations like where there's developments, uh, there's not much mycorrhiza. And there, Different, there's different types of mycorrhiza for different types of plants, but um, uh, a lot of the mycorrhizal, will, mycorrhizal fungi will um, uh, uh, attach itself to a, a large majority of, uh, of our plants. Okay, next slide. Have to uh, turn off the zoom. Yeah, I've done it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the arrow won't work. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, yes, as I mentioned, um, the mycorrhiza can be destroyed uh, by disturbing the soil. So it's good to, uh, to, to, to uh, you know, um, put it back in. Um, this is an image of what it might look like. I, I, I do a lot of tree planting at home and uh, I have a lot of flower beds and I mulch a lot. I, I mulch with wood chips. And I get a lot, a lot of my wood chips from hydro, and I use that as a mulch. And when I, when I uh, move that mulch aside, I'll find a lot of these white roots in there. And those are mycorrhizal roots. And I know that that's because there's a healthy soil. There's a, there's a healthy environment there for plant growth. And so it's good when you see that, you know. Uh, and you may, yeah, you may, you may break up a few of them off, but the, there's enough there that they just they regrow and you, you, you don't get rid of them. So it's a very uh, healthy soil environment. Um, let's see if I have, okay, next slide. Typically, sometimes you'll see some of these. These, I say, they're, they're the, the mushrooms that we commonly call them toadstools or mushrooms. It's the fruiting body of the, the whole plant itself. Next slide. Uh, this is a fairy ring. I don't know if you've ever noticed it. Um, that usually happens when the tree's been removed and the, the roots are, are dying. Uh, the mushrooms are feeding, uh, uh, they're decaying, they're helping to decay the roots that are underground. This is typically a, a saprophytic fungus that, that, that decays uh, the, the dying wood. Are they edible? Uh, <laughs> that is a specialty on its own. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend to, to you, that you pick up any wild mushroom and eat it unless you know exactly for sure if it's edible because they can, uh, can be tricky. Uh, this is typically their um, shelf mushrooms or conks that attach themselves to the base of a dead or dying tree and they, they decompose the wood. And uh, like uh, Owen said with the big spruce tree in the, in the forest, they had the, the, the rod at the base, the button rod, may have had some of those and a uh, wind comes along and snaps it off. These are called earth stars and uh, they, come out like this and then they open this way 
and they, they, they send out uh, clouds of smoke, which are the spores, and they propagate that way. These, uh, I think, I believe, they're mycorrhizal fungi as well. Uh, they're good. All mushrooms are good for, for, the, for the environment they grow in. I don't know if they're, I wouldn't tell you to eat one. No, I mean, for plants. Yes. Yeah. yeah, no, they're either, they're either decomposing organic matter. I found a whole bunch, a whole bunch of them in my place. Uh, growing in a place where there was used to be a big uh, Manitoba maple growing and it would all turn to dust, but it, you could still see the organic matter. And I found those growing in there. Uh, and I, would, I said, well, there must be saprophytic. They're helping to decompose what's left of the uh, stump of Manitoba maple. But I, 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 it seems to me I read that they were also mycorrhizal. So uh, they, they perform a, a, a function. Next. Uh, this is the fly agaric. Amanita muscaria, I believe. Um, very showy. Don't eat it. It's deadly poisonous. Mm -hmm. That one, I yeah, know for sure. Yeah, for sure. Sometimes the showy mushrooms are very, uh, very deadly. This is a, a giant pop ball. There's a pocket light just to show the, the I mean, we've all seen those. Those are, um, you haven't seen those? No, and he's talking to us. Right. Yeah. Slice yeah, you the slice the them and you can cook them. Yeah, those are edible. Yeah. Put them in yeah. Where would you find that? I've never seen Almost that. anywhere. They grow uh, sheep My dad loves sheep On sheep fields, okay. Yeah. Well, I have them on my property. They grow in different places on my property. Okay. And uh, uh, they're pretty well everywhere. <laughs> and uh, if you leave them, then they turn brown. And they, uh, and you, uh, it's fun to step on them because then they, there's a cloud of spores that come out, <laughs> and they, they'll they'll go everywhere, and, and they'll make grow new mushrooms. This, does anybody recognize this scene? Uh, avatar. 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 Yeah. So this is, this is just to show you, this is the big mother tree in Avatar, and this is the very nourishing tree that was there, you know, nourishing everything that was around it, and this is really true. It, Big mother trees are good for that, and that's why we need them. And uh, you know what happened when they brought their big machines around and destroyed that? Well, you know, it's like when you're clearing out the land, uh, and you're taking all the trees out, and you leave a few trees. Chances are those trees will not survive because you've disturbed the soil so much, you've, you've uh, eradicated the mycorrhizal fungi, and um, you've uh, cut off a lot of the tree's roots. So the tree starts to decline over the years. Starts to start to slow decline, especially if it's an old tree. They like their environment, and if it's changed drastically, they will decline and start to die off. Next, this is a um, okay. That's the doctor. This is a Dr. Monica Gagliano um, from Australia, and she's uh, studying plant bioacoustics. Oh, well, before I go on to this. Uh, if anybody's interested in, in uh, seeing some videos on um, mycorrhizal fungi on TED Talks on YouTube, by uh, Dr. Suzanne Simao. Uh, she's the um, professor of forest ecology at the University of British Columbia, and she has a lot of videos on uh, mycorrhizal fungi in uh, Suzanne Simao. Okay, she is. Um, doing some work again. She's in the, from the University of Western Australia, the Center for Evolutionary Biology. And her research is based on the, the fact that plants uh, not only generate sound, but they can perceive it as well. And she's demonstrated that, like she uses frequencies and vibrations. And they've, 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 they've done experiments with corn seedlings and they found that the roots of corn seedlings emit little clicking sounds. And that these clicking sounds attract other corn seedlings. Uh, to grow, grow close to them. So they're doing, a, this is a very new area of research, but they're finding that um, there's a lot of uh, potential there, and they're, they're discovering a new, uh, I guess, a way that plants are communicating through uh, bioacoustics. Now there's also electrical signaling. Uh, next slide. Um, it's been shown that um, flowers can actually communicate their presence to pollinating insects. Um, so when the when the, the flowers sense the presence of pollinators, uh, they emit uh, uh, an attractant, uh, and often it's electrical. The uh, the bees emit.
admit they have a positive charge, there's a negative charge in the flowers and, and that, that attracts them. But then the, the flower will also shoot out some, some, uh, some pollen <coughs> to attract the bees to the flowers. Um, so, uh, next slide. So this is uh, referred to as buzz pollination. They can, they can actually hear the, the buzz made by approaching these uh, flight muscles and they release pollen at just the right moment. Uh, and the pollen is ejected. So some researchers actually uh, believe that plants possess a chemical and electrical signaling system that are similar as those in animals. This is ongoing research again. Um, uh, yeah, these are all pollinators. It could be uh, butterflies, bees, uh, even uh, the hummingbird. Um, so uh, basically, uh, the concept of plant intelligence um, we have to look outside the box. We can't think of our intelligence in terms of human intelligence. Um, because uh, uh, as Owen said, you know, trees, they're not, they're not moving targets, they're, they're stationary. And they need, and in the case of, like you said, with the uh, introduced insects, they're not accustomed to that. So they haven't developed uh, an immune system that can respond to, say, the ravages of uh, an introduced insect like the emerald ash borer. And uh, genetically, there may be a few species or individuals, not species, but individuals within a species that can have that potential. And through natural selection over the years, as the, as the plants start to uh, reproduce themselves, this will uh, come out with, uh, let's say, an ash that, that can compete, or not compete, but can fight off the invasion of the emerald ash borer. Because right now, it's a big you know, free-for-all. So.